Sisters and brothers, it is so good to be with you on this Lord's Day. And I want to thank our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley, for an opportunity to share a word with you. If you have your Bibles, please open them to Exodus chapter 2. I'd like to read verses 5 through 10. Exodus 2, 5 through 10 reads as follows. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw a basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. I'd like to share with you this morning on the topic, side eye. Side eye, let us pray. God who calls us and cares for us. We ask that your Holy Spirit would come into this literal space, into our virtual space and make it holy ground so that we might hear from you today and be transformed. Amen. We are all familiar with the term side eye because most of us have had the experience of giving someone side eye. And this whole concept of side eye is based on what we know about how the human eye works. The, the human eye is designed to see what is in front of it and optimal vision is what occurs kind of from the center of your eye going out at an acute angle. This is our ideal sight. Anything over here is what we call our peripheral vision. And we cannot see what's behind us, right? That means that when we think about the way the eye is designed, we must acknowledge that even seeing people can't see everything. We see best when looking straight ahead. This over here, this peripheral vision is not as good as what is happening here. And contrary to what Big Mama told you, she does not have eyes in the back of her head. I want you to keep that in mind as we think about the phenomenon and the metaphor of seeing in the Bible. Remember, if you have sight, you can see some things but not others. Optimal vision is partial vision. Seeing people have blind spots. So bring whatever senses you have and come with me to Exodus chapter two, where we come to this iconic story about the baby Moses that has captured our imagination. Here we have that baby in the basket, in the bulrushes, and this would-be deliverer Moses is delivered. Now, the narrator tells the story from the perspective or the vantage point of someone who can see it all. But the people in the story don't have that perspective. Moses' mother does not know what is going to happen to her child. Miriam is going to have to move along with the basket to see where it goes. And I assure you that Pharaoh's daughter had no idea that her life was about to change. The narrator draws images with words. This is a visual text that creates pictures and it describes what the characters see. And the narrator is setting up a scenario for us where two worlds, one enslaved family that's trying to preserve the life of a baby 
and another family, a princess protected by privilege. These two worlds are about to collide, and everything changes when she sees a basket. Now the text doesn't tell us whether the basket was in her direct line of sight, whether she caught a glimpse of it with her peripheral vision and then turned to the side to see it. We don't know whether it came right to her or whether she has to position her body. I wasn't there, but I can assure you that rescuing a baby from a basket was not on her to-do list for the day. It is nowhere in her job description. It didn't show up in the princess manual, and it's not under other duties as assigned. What she did on that day was not within her purview. Rescuing slave babies—that was not her thing. Think about it. First of all, she was on the wrong team. She's an Egyptian. That's not what Egyptians do for Hebrews. On top of that, she was from the wrong family. She's Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's the dude who enslaved them in the first place and ordered these boys to be killed. And we should also acknowledge that this is a world that's not accustomed to women doing the rescuing. But she is the one who is at the turning point in the whole story. Right here in chapter two, before Moses grows up and goes to Midian. Before he sees the burning bush on Mount Horeb, before his rod turns into a snake, before he puts his hand in the robe and takes the robe, you know, the hand out and becomes withered and puts it back in and it becomes whole, before all of the plagues with the blood and the frogs and the flies, before let my people go, there is a woman in a position to change the course of history. Now. I want us to pause here just for a moment before we go any further, and acknowledge the fact that God loves selecting people on their way to do one thing and pull them in to something else. Remember our friend Saul, who's trying to be a good follower of God and persecute these pesky Christians when a light falls out of heaven and changes his life. Or Deborah sitting under a tree, just trying to do the thing, just trying to judge, and here comes Barak asking her to lead people into battle. Or Gideon just trying to get a little food together, something that the oppressors won't take, and here comes this angel calling him a mighty warrior. And here we have Pharaoh's daughter, just trying to go get a bath, because you know princesses have a hard life. And here comes this baby in a basket. God often takes people who are on their way to do one thing and do another. And when we recognize how often it happens, it makes me wonder why do we get so surprised when God disrupts our lives? Why do we get so worked up when God alters our plans? Why do we get all agitated when God takes us out of our safety zones, calling us to vocations that do not line up with our skill set? When we think about it, it kind of makes sense. If you can't see everything, and God's vantage point allows God to see everything. Then it's going to happen quite regularly that God is going to introduce something into our lives that's going to come to us from the side or behind. There's going to have there are going to be more than a few moments when something comes to us that we couldn't see coming. We will experience God moving in our lives as a change in plans, or as an interruption, or a left turn when we wanted to turn right, or a light shining from heaven that causes us to fall down, or a baby coming down the river. Pharaoh's daughter has this surprise encounter that changes the course of history, and I want to suggest to you that what happens to her has an impact on us. 
and how we can deal with the changes that come in our lives. Let me just share、uh, a few points with you. Three, exactly. And the first point is the first miracle in this story is that she saw a basket at all. The passage says that she went out to bathe and she saw a basket. And it gives it to us in this very matter of fact way. But I don't think there's anything matter of fact about it. Remember, physical sight is limited. We can only see optimally what's right here. And we choose what we are going to see and what we're not going to see based on our position. Stay with me here. You can only see what's in front of you or what's on your side. And so you have to position yourself to see differently. Similarly, if you are in a position of power, you will position yourself to see what you need to see. Another way of putting it is if you are going to maintain empire, you're going to have to have selective vision. If you want to maintain an advantage, you may have to limit what you expose yourself to. Now, when I was in high school, I ran track and I was the second fastest sprinter on the team. The second fastest sprinter. The fastest sprinter was my younger sister. And so, in the four by 100,、um, and then back. Back in that day, it was actually the 440. But anyway,、um, so we each ran 110 yards. But back in the day, she was the first leg on the 440, 4x110, four four, four and I was the last leg. All right? She was the fastest. She started off. I was the second fastest. And so I brought it home. And I made my peace with being the second fastest. I was happy to be the second fastest. And so long as we stayed within the narrow world of our very small high school, I was the second fastest. But as soon as we started to play larger schools and go to larger venues, my supremacy began to come down. Wasn't as fast as I thought I was. And it, the only way to remain really fast was to limit who I exposed myself to. If you are going to maintain privilege, you have to see in a certain way. You have to see some things and not others. And you have to see in a world that says there's an us and a them, a worthy and an unworthy, thinkers and idiots, enlightened and dullard. The refined people and the brutes. If you want to maintain your special status, if you want to keep your special privilege, you have to choose who and what you are going to see. The princess should not have even lowered her gaze. Now, I don't know if she was bored or if she was curious. But the fact that she saw the basket is a miracle. She saw it and she acknowledged it. And here's where we learn that seeing is risky business because once she sees it, she can't unsee it. Some things cannot be unseen. And I wonder if this is why some of us don't like looking in the eyes of the unhoused. We don't like looking in the eyes of people who are in need because then we can't unsee what we have seen. If the princess wants to maintain her privilege, she's going to need to have some tunnel vision. But in this story, she decides to see, and the act of seeing leads to her doing something. She decides to get the basket. Well, Actually, she sent her servant to get the basket because she's a princess after all. But, but you get the point that she acts as a result of seeing. And I think sometimes all God is asking of us is an openness, a willingness to see something we wouldn't ordinarily see, the ability to step outside of our prescribed script and move to the margins. To the periphery, to what is on our side, so that God can move in our lives. 
The first miracle of the princess is that she saw. But the second miracle is that she saw a baby. Now stay with me here because the text says she saw the basket and it was brought to her and she opened it up and she saw a baby. It says she heard him because he was crying and she recognized that this must be one of the Hebrew babies. The second miracle is what she sees. Remember who her daddy is. Remember where she comes from. Her father, Pharaoh, represents empire. And in his world, the Egyptians are human and the Hebrews are vermin. We as readers see this story and we're so excited when she finds the baby, but we forget that it is not required that she see the baby's humanity. She has been given alternate narratives about who these people are. And when she sees a baby, she is going off script. She is doing something that is subversive. Imagine a world where recognizing somebody's humanity is subversive. When I was um, in, when I lived in Connecticut, I had an opportunity to teach a class in Niantic Women's Prison. And I, I've talked about this experience before because it changed my life so much. This was a maximum security prison. So I'm going into a prison with women um, that I should be a little afraid of. And I'm coming in to teach this course. And I remember the first time I walked in, I got into the room and the women in the room started approaching me in a way that made me feel a little uncomfortable until I realized that they wanted to put their hands on me because I was pregnant. They wanted to put their hands on my belly. And in that moment, I realized that these criminals were mothers who were separated from their children. It was the place where we could connect and I was able to see their humanity. And I want to be clear about what's happening here. Moses isn't worthy of saving because of what he grows up to do. Moses is worthy of saving because he is a human made in the image of God. I think one of the greatest mistakes we make in the church is we confuse our value with our accomplishments. Do you ever notice how when the church is giving out awards or helping people in need, how so many churches want to talk about how deserving these people are, how gifted they are and how bright they are. And the fact of the matter is that doesn't matter. What matters is that they're created in the image of God. And Pharaoh's daughter sees what his mother sees. Pharaoh's mother, Pharaoh's daughter, I'm sorry, sees what his mother sees and she sees what God sees. She sees the child as the creator sees him. No matter what Pharaoh has declared or proclaimed over an entire race of people based on his fear, out of his desire to maintain supremacy, she sees his humanity and that recognition saves his life. I'm going to say that again. She sees his humanity and that recognition saves his life. Church, I want you to think about all the categories of people and all the communities of people that you have been formed to see as something other than or less than and challenge you to start seeing like Pharaoh's daughter. When you see someone's humanity, you don't know whether or not you might be saving their life. See what God sees, a child of God. Pharaoh's daughter sees and she sees a baby. And when she responds to the need in front of her, she finds she's got a new job in addition to princess. Remember, 
In this entire episode of the baby and the basket and the little girl and the wet nurse, none of this is on her agenda for the day. I'm pretty sure she woke up that morning thinking maybe after my bath ritual, I will go commune with the river goddess. Maybe I'll have a spa session. Maybe I'll get some of those sea salts from the Dead Sea. Maybe I'll attend to my own family. And here comes a basket right out of her line of sight that presents a situation to her with a baby. And in that moment, another world intrudes and she finds her real purpose. So in the end, is that an interruption or was that God's plan all along? Sisters and brothers, this morning I am speaking to those of you who are planners. You know who you are. The people who wake up in the morning and like to know everything that's going to happen in the day. In fact, you want to know everything that's going to happen in this week. You want to know what's going to happen for the month. If you could plan out your whole year right now, you would be one happy person. And it is hard for you to understand how the God who sees and knows all can't just give us that information right now. God, maybe I'd be all right dealing with whatever's coming if you would just tell me what it is, if, if I could just prepare myself for what it is. And we all have that desire, but that desire is based on a false assumption. You see, our eyes play tricks on us because we think we can see everything. And we forget that even 2020 vision can't see it all. So if we want to make peace with the way God has designed us to see, we need to take a lesson from the visually impaired. You see, people who are visually impaired know you can't trust your eyes. You can't see under all circumstances. I can't see without help and I can never see it all. So I'm going to have to rely on some of my other senses. I'm going to have to rely on my ability to pray. I'm going to have to rely on the Holy Spirit to give me guidance. I'm going to have to trust that the God who started this thing in me is going to finish. I'm going to have to do a little David thing sometimes and just encourage myself and remember that even when I get it wrong, God's plan will be fulfilled in my life. You can only see or discern so much because you were never designed to see it all. But what we know is that God's work will be completed in you in spite of your limited vision. Let me tell you how I know. The third point here is about what Pharaoh's daughter thinks she is doing versus what she's actually doing. Pharaoh's daughter says, when the baby comes back to her, I'm going to name him Moses because I drew him out of the water. That's what his name means. So that there is here what we call an etymology, an explanation for Moses' name that means drawn out, except that's not exactly what it means. Actually, the way that the word comes to us in the Hebrew text is the one who draws out. Stay with me. Moses' daughter thinks she's saying, I drew him out. But in the text, what his name really means is I drew him, the one who draws out. You see, she thought about what she was doing, but the God who can see all sees past the moment of what she's doing. Stay with me. What she did was draw him out. But in the remix of God's design, what's happening is what Moses will do. Moses draws out. And this understanding of Moses drawing out is bigger than Pharaoh's daughter. What Pharaoh's daughter does happens here, and that is connected to what Moses is going to do here. And when Moses draws out, then that becomes the metaphor for what a woman by the name of Harriet Tubman will do. So Harriet Tubman, also called Moses, embodies this act of drawing out. And it doesn't end there because after that, we have the story of a people who in their ritual of Passover, remember, 
over and over again, the act of God drawing them out. And it's not limited to that because it becomes the paradigm for what Christians understand is happening in the act of salvation by Jesus Christ. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters, drew me out, lifted me. Now safe am I. Love lifted me. Pharaoh's daughter's action gets repeated again and again and again. And so we will never see all of what God does. But if we do our part, we can entrust the God who sees all to finish our story, to finish the thing that we have begun. All we need to do is let God work with what comes in as an interruption and trust God to do the thing beyond what we can see. Let's pray. God who sees all, we entrust our limited vision, our limited perspective, and our limited understanding to you. Help us to respond to the interruptions and the things that come at us on the side so that you can use us in your ongoing work of salvation. Amen.